What's up guys, Philip Kyle and Peck Pythons in the snake pit. We got nidovirus. I was not wrong. My assumptions were not wrong. Not proud of that. I am happy to understand where we are, but we've got a long, long road ahead of us. If you haven't been following along, I have had about eight months of sporadic illness in my collection. Uh, this is my collection of ball pythons. Well, the majority of them, some of them are up in my two separate quarantines. Whew. A few weeks ago, we had an animal die kind of randomly, pretty randomly. Uh, it was having some diarrhea symptoms for a very short period of time and then perished. So we sent that animal, that was Venus, off for a necropsy. That necropsy was completed by the University of Florida. And we can go into detail on that here in a few. After the necropsy was completed, it was suspected that the cause might be nidovirus based on some findings in the necropsy. If you don't know what a necropsy is, that's an autopsy for reptiles. So they suspected nidovirus. We sent off a sample, or they sent off a sample to test for nidovirus, and that test came back positive. Got that right, right here. I don't know if it's backwards for you guys, but that says Venus right there. Nato virus PCR result was positive. Damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. Not good, not good, not good. So, if you guys aren't aware of what nidovirus is, it's an extremely contagious virus that is, comes in several strands that can affect different species, but this result tells us that we have ball python serpentovirus, which is only spread amongst ball pythons. Uh, possibly another they, they have had a few cases where certain strands cross over into other species but for the most part it's been isolated to pythons and boas <sighs> there's no cure there's no cure and to make it worse animals can be asymptomatic so out of my 70 something animals, technically they could all have it right now. And I wouldn't know it if they were all asymptomatic. Not showing signs of illness, but carrying, being a, a, uh, a carrier of the, the virus. That's possible. How do we sort out who has it? I am going to have to very carefully take each one of these ball pythons out of their enclosure, take a swab and swab the cloanal area, which is the top of the mouth. Take those swabs, all 70 something of them, and send them off to a lab to be tested. Uh, they're gonna go through the same PCR, or very similar PCR test to what University of Florida does. And when we get results back for each of those individuals, that will tell us which have the virus and which don't. If an animal comes back not a virus positive, and it's a, and it's symptom and it uh, and it is symptomatic. 
which means it is showing some signs of illness, diarrhea, respiratory infection, lethargy, anorexia, not wanting to eat. Uh, any of those things can be signs that it is physically ailed by the virus. Those animals are gonna be euthanized. And no, I'm not gonna do any of the YouTube DIY euthanasia crap. I'm not gonna bash anybody for doing that stuff. That is not for me. My vet has agreed to help me through this process and they will be handling all of my euthanizing uh, simpler that way it's better for the animals i mean reptiles are the thing is that it's very tricky because reptiles are very they're very hardy they're very difficult to euthanize so there are people that claim there's ways to do it at home that are safe or whatever i'm not going to get into all that but that's not for me mm. Once we euthanize any positive animals that are symptomatic, I intend to take a number of positive animals that are asymptomatic, not showing any signs of ailment. And I'm gonna isolate them in one or potentially both of my quarantines. Probably just one of them. Um, man, this is mentally draining. I've had this information for about three days now, and I've been just constantly wheels grinding, trying to figure out how to share this in a way that's going to benefit you guys. I'm going to share this document today. We're going to read through some of this. I'm going to give you all some of the details, um, and then we're going to talk about where we go from here, I expect that the direction of this channel being focused predominantly on breeding initially is now going to be focused predominantly on uh, nidovirus. Yay! Finding, avoiding, isolating, treating. How to take a sick colony and recover, or a sick breeding operation and recover in a way that is somewhat sane and good for the animals. And hopefully through this process, I'll be able to sort out things that haven't been sorted out yet. I mean, this is something that hasn't really been brought to light um, in the ball python community specifically. It's been around in Greek tree pythons for nearly a decade. They have, being a smaller group of breeders, they have basically uh, sorted it out amongst themselves and they know how to avoid it. It is openly discussed and understood to what some degree and in the ball python community it is something that people are generally aware of some people are generally aware of but there's lots of new breeders like myself that was not aware of the severity of this virus uh, i've heard of viruses broadly and the effects that they could have on a colony but not to the extent that I was prepared for it or that I felt pre prepared for it. So I want to take uh, you new breeders along with me and experienced breeders and anyone. And I plan on really pushing the envelope and I have a testing facility that's willing to work with me 
and I have some theoretical experiments that I'd like to uh, try that may increase the accuracy of testing. And um, I'm open to considering possible treatments, which at this point there are none. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that like I'm gonna cure nidovirus. Uh, I'm not some superhero, but I'm not gonna exclude that as an option. I've, I am willing to kind of push the envelope. Uh, my breeding operation is shut down probably for the next year and a half, which means that it's very likely that I could, or it's, it's very practical in that case, for me to maintain an isolated group of carriers of the virus and study them and use that information to share with others and you guys that might benefit the ball python community as a whole. I surely hope it will. So we'll see how that goes. Ugh, it's a mess. It's messy, messy, mess. Messy, messy, mess. Next couple videos are gonna talk about what nidovirus is, how you can avoid it, how you can identify it, how you can't get it, because there's some misconception there. And I'm hoping to have that up probably in a few more days, maybe this weekend, something like that. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we're gonna skim through this document. I'll share a little bit of this information. It's a lot of really big words that I don't understand. So strap in. The beginning of this is the notes from my vet, my exotic vet to University of Florida explaining the history of my circumstances. Um, and then it gets down here into the final anatomic or etiologic diagnosis. I don't know what that means, but the diagnosis, let's just go with that. Uh, it's seven different items that they notated. Bacterial bronchointerstitial pneumonia, comma severe. So they're, they're calling that, uh, that as a severe case of bron bacterial bronchointerstitial pneumonia. Number two, necrotizing enteritis, comma, severe. Rhinitis, comma, moderate to severe with intralesional bacteria. Pharyngitis, comma, moderate with intralesional bacteria and minimal epithelial hyperplasia. Esophagitis, comma, mild. Interstitial nephritis, comma, moderate with tubular degeneration and intraluminal bacteria. And the last note, circulating granulocytosis, moderate to marked. I don't know what that means, moderate to marked, but let's just say moderate. If anyone knows what moderate to marked means, feel free to comment that down below if you've made it this far. Uh, and I'm gonna try to read through these notes really quickly. They're big words. I don't know these words. I really don't even know necessarily exactly what I'm reading. I've kind of got a gist of it from my vet. So we'll go through that. There were multiple, there were multiple significant pathologic findings ongoing in this ball python at the time of death. The most clinically significant lesions were present in the lungs and in the intestine. 
in the lungs, there was a severe bacterial bronchointerstitial pneumonia that would have dramatically affected respiration. Concurrent to the pneumonia, there were also changes in the upper respiratory tract, oral cavity, and esophagus, suggestive of a mild slash early serpentovirus infection, also known as nidovirus, including mild epithelial hyperplasia. Samples were collected at necropsy for possible serpentovirus testing, and that testing is available. Please contact Dr. Ozaboff. He's also known as Dr. Oz. If you've ever watched any of the uh, Carpet Fest videos, he does the nidovirus, or he kind of, it seems like he leads the nidovirus uh, team there that's raising funds for nidovirus research. Contact him to discuss additional testing. Uh, however, there was also a severe necrotizing enteritis that extended into the mucosa and into the wall of the small intestine. This lesion was associated with mixed bacteria and given the severity of the process, bacterial translocation and septicemia are also possible. The identification of significant circulating granulocytosis, granulocytosis, intraluminal bacteria within kidney tubules and the granulomat granulomatous meningitis further support potential bacterial septicemia in this case. Necrotizing enteritis is not usually seen as a result of serpentivirus, also known as nidovirus, in snakes. Given the findings of high numbers of trichomonids on a fecal of another patient, it is possible that the enteritis started off as a protozoal infection with secondary bacterial infection. Unfortunately, the trichomonads and monocercomonads are incredibly difficult to discern in histologic sections. Also present um, admixed with the inflammation in the small intestines were high numbers of nematode larva and embryonated ova. The significance of these parasites in this individual are unclear. So then it goes into detail about the findings of each specific organ and its issues that it that were found and documenting which samples were tested and stored for future samples and examination. So at the point where it said um, samples were collected at necropsy for possible serpentivirus testing, obviously I think I mentioned earlier in the video that at the point at the point that we received this report and were given the option to proceed with nidovirus testing, we immediately accepted that and proceeded to get these results about a week later. Positive result for nidovirus. So, ugh, what a mess. Fortunately, I've received a ton of support from people who've been down this road. Um, the majority of the people that I have encountered have taken the route of basically euthanizing anything that comes back positive. And while that is the industry standard and it is perfectly uh, humane, uh, I do want to try to maintain a small colony of asymptomatic positive animals with nidovirus and going to manage that very, very carefully to the extent that I will never encounter both colonies on the same day so that I can do my research 
and try to bring to light some things that haven't fully been sorted. Like how long can the virus survive outside of the host? Like in a dirty tub or uh, on a pair of tongs. Um, how quickly can disinfectants uh, kill the virus? What period of exposure is required in order to kill the virus? Which types of disinfectants are effective or ineffective against this virus? Um, how can we be more certain about the negative <laughs> test results from a PCR for nidovirus? Currently, the industry standard is around 80 to 85% accuracy for a negative. So if I send off all these animals, let's say I send off all these animals and they all come back negative. Let's say it's 100 animals. I send 100 animals off and they all come back negative. The industry, the current industry standard from the professionals that I've spoken with, would indicate that if I tested them again in two months, two to three months, about 15 to 20% of those animals are going to now have positive results for serpentivirus. Now, if they're all negative and I don't introduce any new animals, then that means that those 15 to 20 animals did have it at the original test and that for some undetermined reason, the virus was not shedding is the term they use. So when the swab was taken, there was not significant virus present in that saliva to show up in a PCR test. So we have, I've discussed with some professionals and I've come up with a few theories on how to be more certain when you take a test that it is truly negative and not a false negative. Ways to ensure that the virus load in the animal is either at its peak or nearing its peak so that it is as prevalent in the body as possible to ensure, assuming it has it. If it doesn't have it, then there, it, it won't make any significant difference. It'll still be negative. If the animal does have the virus, it's almost like uh, peaks and valleys. They have a lot of the virus pre present, very easily detected, very little virus present, nearly impossible to detect, and then back and forth. And somehow, for some reason, there is a, there is a documented cycle that, is, there, that has been proven how that cycle functions has not yet been discovered and I'm hoping that we can to some extent sort that out. So over the next month, couple months, we'll be hopefully doing some of that testing. Uh, it will be, it won't be anything inhumane or won't be torturing the animals. It will be uh, relatively simple things that we plan to do and I will discuss those as the information can be shared and as much information as I can learn that would benefit others will be shared. I, I don't plan on retaining any of this. I want to do this for the good of the community and I don't intend to be greedy about my information or charge for it or anything like that. This isn't really like propri proprietary technology or anything like that. I'm just, uh, you know, hillbilly engineering. We'll see. But, oh, got kind of long-winded. I appreciate you guys sticking around. I appreciate all the support I've received. Stay tuned if you're a new breeder and you don't want to go through this, stick around. 
I'll be sharing tips and tricks on how to avoid it. If you're a new breeder and you think, or if you are anyone and you think you may be going through something like this, feel free to reach out to me on any of my social media, Facebook, Instagram, or on here through the comments. And uh, stick around. Feel free to subscribe. I'll put you a little button right here. You can subscribe if you want to. If you aren't aware of what's been going on, I'll put a video here from when we first thought night of virus might have been the case. But that's it for now. You guys take it easy. If it ain't easy, don't take it. Peace.